This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, Marco Mangelsdorf is uh, my co-host contributor, and we have today Henry Curtis. We're going to talk about the PUC decision a couple of days ago on Hu Honua. Ah, you know, more action in that one case than I, you could shake a stick at in years and years. Uh, so first thing is, Marco, can you introduce Henry? Tell us about him. Tell us about the scope of this discussion now to follow. I'm really, really pleased to have Henry join us today because he has uh, been uh, one of the main players, one of the good guys, the good guy on this uh, long and arduous uh, path of Huhonua, Helco trying to get across the finish line and they've been uh, denied for the second time. So thank you so much, Henry, for joining us on uh, short notice like this. Uh, and uh, I'll let you take it away. What, uh, what went down from our, our friends and colleagues and all the above at the Public Utilities Commission on Monday? Well, the, well thank you, Marco, and thank you, Jay, for having the show. Um, the Public Utilities Commission found that the Huhonua proposal simply does not make sense, that there are a lot of unanswered questions. Who who knew us said, well, then if there are unanswered questions, just tell us what you want us to do and we'll talk about it. But of course, the applicant coming in has the burden to show that their case is reasonable instead of turning around to the regulator and saying, you tell us what you want. So the PUC rejected the uh, power purchasing agreement for the second time. And now we're in a, a post PUC process. Yeah, so what was, the, what was the background of this hearing? I, I can recall reading not too long ago that it was continued for a week or so in March, was it? And then yes. uh, at the end of that hearing, uh, they sat down, wrote their opinion, and they came up with a two to one decision here. So what, yes. what's the background for that? There was an evidentiary hearing where you're allowed to cross examine witnesses on all sides. I found it interesting that the dissent argued that because Lifeland does not cross-examine all witnesses, that means we have no controversies with any of the witnesses. Rather, you look at the entire evidence in this case over the past several de years and decades to determine how you argue your position. So after the evidentiary hearing, all the parties presented their statement of position, their legal brief, and the PUC weighed all of the information and came out with the uh, rejection of the power purchase agreement. Mm. So one of the things uh, in the dissent I noticed uh, by Leo Ascension, um, the third commissioner, uh, was that um, no, the uh, Supreme Court referred this back, remanded it back for a specific you know, hearing on a specific issue. And uh, he looked only at that issue and found that the burden that Huhonua was under pursuant to the remand had been met, uh, having to do with greenhouse gases. Um, now, do you agree with that statement? And if not, why? No, um, Lifeland disagrees with that statement. That statement that he presented was probably written by, or I shouldn't say that, it, it may have been written by Hu Honua or certainly by someone very familiar with Hu Honua's arguments that the, PU, that the Supreme Court focused on a very narrow topic. But the Supreme Court actually said, and if you look at the first couple of pages of the decision, they actually said Life of Land appealed on three issues. And they said, we're granting Life of Land's issues on one and two, but not three. And to which Hu Honua said, well, the Supreme Court doesn't understand the word and. One and two are really the same thing. It's really a narrow focus. It's really just on greenhouse gases. Um, that we find totally bogus. Cost has to be one of the issues you look at. The fact that Hu Honua will raise the rates of every resident on the Big Island for 30 years, that has to be a factor. And the commission recognized that. Yeah, if you're going to look at a power purchase agreement, you got to consider cost, right? And just, I mean, just coming in from from the side, that would you would expect that. You would expect yes. any examination of any power purchase agreement to be um, an examination of cost, among other things. 
Now, the other is the, um, you know, the, 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 the general discussion of the environmental considerations. Um, you know, I, I guess who will know was saying this is not a problem. Um, you know, uh, the, the greenhouse gas effect is offset by other factors. And, and, and indeed, uh, uh, Warren Lee of Hu Honua uh, in, in the newspaper article in Civil Beat uh, was saying it's not a problem because, we, you know, there are countervailing uh, considerations uh, that would offset um, the concern about greenhouse gases. What are your thoughts about that? Well, the major offset would occur outside of Hawaii and would involve procedures and protocols that are not yet established. So what Huhunua said is, after the commission approves the power purchase agreement, then we will sit down with the PUC and discuss with them how we can actually prove we have offsets on the continent. Now, that raises several interesting issues because, one, the PUC does not regulate Huhunua. The Public Utilities Commission regulates utilities, not biomass companies. Second, the PUC regulates what happens in Hawaii, but can't regulate what happens outside of Hawaii. And third, um, as the PUC noted, Huhonua litigates everything. In fact, they have a $1.5 to $2 billion lawsuit right now hanging over Hiko's head. Huhonua is suing Hiko in federal court for $1.5 to $2 billion. So for who who knew it to turn around and say to the PUC, first to prove it, and then we'll negotiate on things that you have no jurisdiction and no control over is totally crap. Well, you know, it would seem that there's been plenty of litigation on this and a scorched earth kind of litigation up and down and back and forth to the Supreme Court um, and, you know, various other uh, attempts to uh, change the result of the commission, change the thinking of the commission. Uh, Marco, you were quoted in the Civil Beat article um, to say that um, you, you, know, you complimented the PUC uh, on its resistance to the, quote, onslaught, end quote. And I'd like you to talk about the, um, you know, the, uh, the litigation and the controversy over the years that has surrounded this project and what you mean by onslaught. I bore witness to, uh, to multiple campaigns and controversies and and uh, people trying to get things done. And I can't identify uh, any other issue, any other uh, project, any other effort that has been more dedicated, more relentless, more unceasing, probably more expensive. I of course, none of us are privy to what Huho Nua has been paying for counsel over the years. But I, I got to believe in it. You know, so there's someone high up the food chain there who has made trying to get this across the finish line a very personal and very high priority. And that's, of course, their prerogative to do so. I mean, just one kind of a tangible example to illustrate the onslaught is that you know, we've all known that the commission was going to come up with a decision in order uh, sooner or later, especially with uh, Chair Jay Griffin's departure at the end of next month. And week by week, Huho Nua has continued to take out full page, not full page, but large color ads in the Big Island newspapers and probably Star Advertiser as well just uh, you know, continuing pedal to the metal. And I, I would think maybe now they'll stop, perhaps, or maybe not. Maybe they'll continue the ads. But I mean, there, and, and that's just part of the onslaught, Jay. Uh, it's, it's my belief that they have been pushing and pulling all the possible political levers that they can push and pull, county government, state government, wherever they can, to find allies for their, their efforts to try to bring this power plant across the finish line. So it's, you know, it's clearly backed by very deep pockets and a, uh, an unwillingness to, to, to call it quits. So, I mean, that begs the question to me, and I'd love to get Henry's view on this. 
I mean, you know, if I game this out, we game this out. Huho Nua has, I believe, this week and next week to file a motion for reconsideration and appeal to the commission, fairly short, small window. So let's assume they're gonna do that. And let's assume just for the sake of assumptions that the commission will deny it. Then what, then what? Did they go back to the Hawaii Supreme Court and essentially argue that uh, the commission yet again did not pay attention to explicit directions from the court? They could do that. And let's say they do do that and the court rules in favor of the commission saying, no, they followed it. They followed the, the instructions we gave them. And I know we're, you know, I'm engaging, engaging in hypotheticals here, obviously. But one of the questions I guess I have for you, Henry, if you just kind of go with my sequence here, uh, by then, you know, Jay will be gone or close to being gone. There will be a new commissioner on the commission, Naomi Kauai. Uh, it'll be a different dynamic, of course, whenever you have a new person replacing one of three, of course, a small number. I mean, is it possible, Henry, is it possible that after the scenario uh, that I outlined with a newly formulated commission that the parties, in this case, Helco and Huho Nua, could resubmit the same PPA to a newly formulated commission with the hopes that they will get the two out of three needed, at least two out of three needed, for approval. Is that possible? Well, Marco, you raised several interesting issues, so I'll, I'll try to take them one at a time. First, you're right. They have until, I think, next Thursday to file their motion for reconsideration. Now, filing the motion for reconsideration does not put a stay on the decision. So they have 30 days after the decision to file their appeal to the Supreme Court. It, the Theoretically, the commission could say when they file their motion, yes, we're going to stay the decision, but that's totally not going to happen. So 30 days after the decision, they have to appeal to the court. Now, they can appeal under one of two issues. One, that the PUC did something procedurally wrong. Or second, that they got their basic facts wrong and they interpreted them wrong. In, in the Supreme Court case in Wyau CIP in 1996, the court said, we're not going to second guess the, U the PUC on policy. So Hu Ho Nua would have to show that there's a procedural defect in what um, the PUC did. I think it's ironic that, uh, like, where's the beef? They've spent millions of dollars setting new records, um, pouring newspaper articles on the Big Island and Hawaii and Oahu and elsewhere, they still haven't answered basic questions at the PUC. They've set new records, I think, at the PUC for the lack of transparency. For example, who is who Honua? We're in our 15th year and we still don't know their corporate structure or who owns them. We don't know who their major investors are. No other business that I know of has ever gone to the PUC and said, we won't tell you who we are, but we want you to approve this contract. Um, so we th we're gonna win at the, the Supreme Court. I'm confident of that. Um, but if the, Supreme if the Supreme Court goes favorably, and then they wanna come back and submit their bid again, they would have to do it either through a competitive bidding process. And the HECO RFP3 is, the HELCO RFP3 is about to be released and they could bid into that. But that would start them all over from the very beginning where they'd have to show the utility that they're better than all the other bidders and why they deserve to win. And then the PPA would be filed with the PUC and it would go, the process would start all over from the beginning. Or they could approach the HECO and say, we want a bilateral filing. We don't want to compete with anybody. We simply want to file it. I don't think the Public Utilities Commission would accept that because the Public Utilities Commission has said, in order to get the lowest price, we should be competitively bidding projects. When Hu Honua first started in 2008, 
there were not a lot of competitors, but now there are competitors that offer far cheaper uh, off, uh, options than what Huho Nua is presenting. The notion that one of the Hawaiian Electric companies would enter into a no bid, you know, exclusive PPA uh, just, would just seem to defy credul uh, believability at yes. this point, since especially during days of incredibly high electric costs and the, the need to get new generation that's going to be under contract for decades, right? To get that new generation as competitive as possible. That's one thing, and I, I very much appreciate this, this particular PUC has been very uh, dollars and cents conscious as far as what's the impact gonna be on ratepayers, especially those ratepayers who are struggling already. So, so I really appreciate your, your explanation. And uh, in, in terms of this uh, lawsuit in federal court, it's just essentially been on hold, so to speak, right? It's been an abeyance that uh, I would think uh, if Uho <laughs> Nua, the plaintiff, were to, uh, to revivify or want to move forward with the federal lawsuit, that probably wouldn't take too much, uh, much time or effort to do. Right. It's on hold as long as there is a power purchase agreement being debated at some level. Uh, once, the P once there is a non-appealable defeat of the power purchase agreement, the federal lawsuit kicks back open. And the non-appealable I mean, would... after either they do, well, after they go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says no, then the power purchase agreement is dead. And then the federal lawsuit against HECO can can start moving again. Since the last time the Supreme Court had a bite at this particular issue, uh, where, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was where Hujo Nua essentially tried to postpone the the evidentiary hearings, right? And that was slapped down uh, with some uh, colorful language, I thought, from the court, and that was pretty quick. So, what's your take in terms of? how quickly, and I know it's difficult to predict the court because they have their own schedule, of course, how quickly you think the Hawaii Supreme Court would rule on an appeal from Hu Honua? Not being a lawyer, I would imagine there would be one of two paths forward. The court could either simply reject the appeal saying uh, something or other, or we would go through a section where we brief the court and we have opening briefs, countering briefs, reply briefs, in which case the decision would probably not occur until early next year. Uh, can we just for you know a few minutes here, extract um, the procedural controversy, uh, extract the politics and uh, you know uh, all the trouble, the gauntlet that Marco has been talking about and get back to, um, you know, the basics. I mean, the reason that life of the land has taken its position, the reason that life of the land has continued its position, um, the, you know, public policy concerns that you have and that, that you know, arguably we should have about this project. Uh, I, th I think, you know, we, we sort of, we are in the, what do we call the procedural weeds here, bouncing around between the PUC and the Supreme Court uh, with, you know, what, what a, an ordinary observer might think is pretty technical stuff and pretty political stuff and controversial stuff and fighting for the sake of, uh, of the lawyers, essentially. Um, so, but my question to you is, can you explain to us and the public now, um, you know, what, what the real issues, public policy issues are here and extracting all the procedural stuff you know, it seems to me that that we expect the PUC to determine policy in its statutory area of operation of jurisdiction. So if we look just at public policy, Henry, what are we looking at? I would say that there are three things that it boils down to. One, currently around the world, we're chopping down, we're having a net loss of more than 1 million trees an hour globally. That's the total we chop down, the total we plant, the net loss 
is more than a million trees an hour. That is a very serious in a climate change future. And therefore, there are fights around the world about whether biomass should continue to wholesale chop down forests in light of climate change. That's one issue. The second is transparency. What, show us the facts. Where's the beef? Huhonua is less transparent than any other company I have ever seen in Hawaii. That is not the way you further business. Third, and this is, I think, absolutely critical and picked up by the Public Utilities Commission, their carbon offsets that make them carbon negative are based heavily on speculation and not on substance. Okay, let me ask you this. When we started this discussion, I mean, you know, Marco and me, and once in a while you, and for that matter, in the discussion with Warren Lee, we had him on the show. Um, you know, it, the numbers have changed. As, as I recall, the investment that uh, Huhonua had made at the outset of our examination of this was something uh, over 300 million, not quite $400 million. And then it seemed uh, like that had gone up and it was 400 or more. And the last report is it's over $500 million. I don't know how it went up $500 million if it hasn't operated yet. Uh, maybe that's, uh, you know, administrative costs, uh, legal costs. I, but right now, uh, ostensibly, according to the newspaper, um, Hu Honoa has $500 million into it. Um, and let's assume for a moment that, you know, you could defend the accuracy of that number. I'm not, I, I'm not convinced of it, but let's, let's assume we could defend it. What that, what that says is that um, offshore investment, and as you point out, we may not know exactly who is making this offshore investment, uh, of $500 million is, is at risk here. And the one thing about Hawaii is it's got to learn to manage offshore investment. It's got to learn to attract offshore investment, and it's got to learn to manage the companies uh, that are in, in which that investment is made. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, Hawaii hasn't been that good at either of those things. And in fact, Think Tech has had a number of, um, you know, programs dealing with how you do that properly and improperly sometimes. So <clears throat> one could say, Henry, that we should not be turning away an investment of $500 million, assuming that's the right number, that we should encourage offshore investment, that we should encourage offshore investment in energy. Um, how do you answer that? Uh, you know, Wall Street may say, to the extent that Wall Street may be involved, Wall Street may say, those guys in Hawaii, they're, they're always opposing our investments and squashing our projects. Um, we're not gonna invest anymore. It's just too hard out there. And somebody always pulls the rug on us. What is your answer to that, Henry? As an economist, I would say that we should welcome competitively bid renewable energy projects that drive down the cost for ratepayers, regardless of who is funding it, whether they come from Hawaii or from the United States or Asia or Mars. Whoever has an idea to bring down the rates to increase renewable energy in Hawaii, we should be opening the doors for competitive bidding to get the best price and the best deal. We send a very different message to Wall Street when we say, if you throw a lot of money at a problem, we will let you build it because you've spent that amount of money. That is a very dangerous approach to take. We should welcome good projects but we should be discriminating against really bad projects. Thank you. One last thing um, before I turn this over to Marco to, to close, and that is the man in the street question. You know, Think Tech has been asking this question for uh, since uh, you know since we met you, Henry, a long time, twenty years ago already. Um, you too, Marco. Um, and the question is, hmm, why should I care? Why should Hawaii care, care about how this goes? Why should Hawaii care, um, you know, the man on the street, the woman on the street, about what happens in the PUC, what happens in the Supreme Court, what happens to this project, what happens to renewables or not so renewables on, them, on the big island? Uh, why should I care? 
I would say it boils down to probably two issues for the common person. One is how much is it going to cost my pocketbook? And second, is climate change going to destroy the environment that I know? Um, this project would take more money out of people's pockets and it would do more damage to the environment and to climate change. We need solutions not to step backwards. Uh, I've long been a believer in cost-effective renewables, not renewables at all costs. And uh, I think there's substantial debate uh, regarding whether cutting and burning trees is truly renewable. So the power purchase agreement as proposed and has been considered by the commission on uh, on several occasions now, I believe is shown to my to my satisfaction that this is not cost effective and not on the benefit of big island ratepayers. And second, you know, and and this is more more uh, driven by uh, geographics. Uh, to, uh, the notion of having logging trucks up and down Hamakua Coast from north to south and south to north. Uh, up in Pepekeo, which is not far from where I live in Hilo, uh, the, the people who drive that road and who live nearby as well uh, would be significantly impacted by a plant like that going online. Yes. So that, that's another reason why, why people should do care on uh, the Big Island. Henry, how much uh, of, what, of what you guys have been saying, both you and Marco, um, uh, has uh, an effect on the PUC and the Supreme Court. Do they understand the points you guys just made? I think the PUC and the Supreme Court both uh, understand the issues in this proceeding. I think the common person has has gained a lot of awareness because of the massive amount of media on this. Uh, certainly, um, legislators are far more aware of this issue um and and that is one if you want to say one benefit of who ho Nua is that we have gotten far more press and media out on energy which is a critical issue and the cornerstone of all economic policies yeah i think it's important to mention and i've mentioned this uh, before in similar discussions um that uh, it is to the credit of life of the land that you have stayed with it for all these years. It's to your credit that you, you know, have fashioned uh, your position and maintained your position and found a way to speak on your position through thick and thin, up and down and across. And so uh, admiration goes to Henry for having done that, having done it on behalf of what you perceive to be the proper policy and the proper public sensibility. Thank you for that. As we've been talking, I, I was thinking, if one Henry Curtis and Cat Brady had not brought your case before the court, what, when did you file? The four or five years ago? Uh, there no, have been 2017, so many... right? 2017 yes. is when it was approved by under Randy Wasse's commission. Yes. So, I mean, if you hadn't done that, by all probabilities, that plant would be burning trees right now as we speak. So it is uh, a testament to, you know, this world that can be so tough and so cynical sometimes, a testament to single or two individuals who, you know, see the need, the screaming need to do something to try to stop something not so good from happening. And a lot of times, of course, yeah, you know, that person or two is not successful. But there are also times when they are successful. So uh, I'll just you know riff off of what Jay said and uh, add my 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 respect and my my uh, esteem for you, Henry, for doing what you did and for getting us this far. You know, the thing with Huho Noah, man, is that uh, it's not over until it's over, and I don't think it's over, but I think it's closer to being over. So thank you so much. I think we have moved the ball closer to the end line. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, this all boils down to <clears throat> for decades, we've been talking about renewable energy. We've been talking about clean energy. We've been talking about mm, 
getting off fossil fuel, getting off greenhouse gases and all that. We've been talking about it till we're all blue in the face. Now the question, as Marco puts it, uh, are we going to burn trees? Because trees, sorry, trees is not really clean energy. That's my view. Um, and that's the issue before the House. It's the issue before the PUC, which I think they've you know, pretty much made clear their view on that. And ultimately, the issue, the environmental issue facing the Supreme Court. So that's where we are. And in a way, this test our system. It, it makes us, it, it's an inflection of sorts. Are we going to be serious about clean energy? Or are we going to make exceptions that swallow the rule? Just my reaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Henry. Uh, Henry Curtis, Marco Mangelsdorf, um, really appreciate the discussion. And I'm sure there'll be more to talk about down line. Aloha. Thank you guys. Aloha. Aloha.